Hey, what's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of the Sons of History podcast. Look, I know um, last week we showed Alan's uh, booties or his shoes that he used during MMA, his jock strap, his uh, cup, but now he is in actual uniform, what he fought in, uh, his costume, uh, when he actually fought MMA. Alan, dude, you look freaking fantastic. Well, actually, I was shirtless when I was fighting, but, you know, I wanted to, in the spirit, in the spirit of our conversation today, you know. Right. I, I, I find it odd that you would have chosen, uh, a, a, a Greek costume instead of, you know, possibly, possibly a, like a Persian, uh, costume. Why? Um, but person hey. now actually well you know, i'm just saying that's a little bit closer to your your upbringing i had a i had a good friend of mine who actually and, and i believe he actually did fight ufc not just mma i think he fought actual ufc he was uh, mike the greek i grew up with him so tribute to the greeks yasu or whatever the hell it, it is that they say but you know nonetheless hey you know nonetheless nonetheless, nonetheless. well it's good to see you, man. Uh, happy Halloween, everybody. Uh, this is not a Halloween edition. Look, uh, despite Alan's outfit, uh, it's just we're going to be talking about Sparta, Athens, ancient Greece, um, proxy war. Look, proxy war, it's so it's so funny. Like, this is 2,500 years ago, and it's like, dude, proxy wars are just a, a thing. You can use the phrase that history repeats itself or the Mark Twain, you know, it doesn't repeat, but it rhymes either way you have it. It's like every generation or every other generation, however long of a span of times, like you're seeing, if you go through history, you're like, Hey, that's happening now. And so we're going to be talking uh, to our guest, Paul Ray, uh, about ancient Greece, um, the battles between uh, Athens and Sparta. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I know this is right up your alley, Alan. Oh yeah, it's um, I've I've uh, read pretty much most, if not all, the the ancient Greek uh, books except for uh, I have not read Arian, which it kind of pisses me off because I keep having something else pop up. And uh, all right, I'll read Arian next. I'll read Arian next, and you know, and and then there's also Ruf I think his name is Rufus or something like that. But uh, that's more of a political one, my understanding. So now, isn't Arian? Isn't he the uh, the founder of Arianism? The Arian nation. Now I think that's the people of Thule. <laughs> Thule. Now Ar Arian wrote a book called The Campaign of Alexander. Not, yeah, yeah no, I think uh, the Arian. Actually, the Arians I think came from India, maybe. Um, but yeah, you're thinking of uh, the island of Thule, way up in the north. You know, I always thought it was too late. Is it too late? I don't know what the hell it is. I don't know. I'm just See, kidding. You know me. I, I like to screw with you with uh, with words because you're always very, you you know you know the answer, but I think you pretend to not know the answer to make me feel a little bit better about myself, no, I which read, I appreciate. I read the material. I don't watch YouTube or the History Channel because, first of all, the History Channel, they don't even, the they don't even talk history yeah. anymore. And if you go to YouTube, you don't know who you're who you're listening to. So, yeah. So yeah, I'll just well, I'll read it. Okay, Thule, Alcibiades, uh, Cyrus the Great, Kuros the Great. You know, stuff like that. You just you, uh, all right. I'm just gonna read it and then phonetically, and then I'll mention it to you, and I'll tell our listeners. Okay, so it looks like it's uh, Kuros. Could be Cyrus. I don't know. It's a tough one. Um... Well, this name shouldn't be. Shut up! That's this name shouldn't be. Okay. So, yeah. okay. All right. I, I will. I will give you props on that one. All right. Well played. Bringing in the ancient to the modern. I like that. Yeah. I like that song. So. <laughs> well, here's a name that's not too hard to pronounce. His name is Paul Ray, Doctor Paul Ray, and we've already gotten. Um, Permission to just call him Paul. And that's typically the case with uh, the the people that we have on who are who have their doctorates, the doctors. They're like, don't call me doctor. Just 
call me by my first name. Um, so Paul Ray is the Roger and Martha Mertz visiting fellow, not to be confused with Alan as the Fred and Ethel Mertz visiting fellow, but he is the Roger and Martha Mertz visiting fellow in classics at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He's the professor of history at Hillsdale College, where he holds the Charles O. Lee and Louis K. Lee Chair in Western Heritage. He chairs the Board of Trustees of the Institute of Current World Affairs, and just last year, the University of Piraeus, I guess I'm saying that right, in Greece, honored him with the the Mystocles Statesmanship Award, which is pretty freaking awesome. What have I done with my life? Not too much. Uh, he's also the author of numerous works, including Republics Ancient and Modern, Classical Republicanism, and the American Revolution, Against Throne and Altar, Montesquieu and the Logic of Liberty, and five volumes on the grand strategy of... Did I just say strategy? Like the, 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 the song? Anyways... Uh, The Grand Strategy of Classical Sparta, one of which we are going to be discussing uh, this episode, Sparta's Sicilian Proxy War. So, ladies and gentlemen, you can get that entire now five-volume set, and I believe a sixth is going to be coming out soon. Uh, You can get that uh, on Amazon or wherever you can find books. You can also find any of his works. Uh, You can't find any of Alan's work. Because he hasn't published anything. Uh, you can't find the my Times, works just anywhere. The Epic Times. You can find my work on the Epic Times. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like how you uh, promoted yourself as a writer for the Epic Times on that radio show that you did and not freaking co-host of the Sons of... I you did, hold, 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 you hold, hold, are hold, a hold garbage on, on. No, trash stop, can. Stop. No, no, you didn't listen. I really want to bring on our guest, but I just... You didn't I listen to the show. It's... You didn't listen to the show then. I oh, even no, I saw the name. promo. I saw the promo. I, you didn't met, you, you didn't listen to it because I mentioned I didn't listen your name. to the show. You never even sent me the link. I but mentioned you. I'm name. looking on the promo and I was like, well, there you go. No <sighs> sons of history uh, reflected on this. Thanks a lot, pal. Anyways, I love you to death. And speaking of death, one day I'll probably kill you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've got Paul Ray on the line. Paul, it is wonderful to. To have you with us, sorry to uh, be babbling about, but we hope you're doing well. How are you, my friend? Oh, just fine. I'm just back from Rome. I spent a week there uh, uh, wandering about, but also giving a paper at a conference on Sparta. Wow, fantastic. Well, uh, hey, you know, I just got back from D.C., and I think we replicated a lot of at least architecture, so I guess in spirit... No, not even close. No, I, I've never been to Rome. I wanted to go to Rome. Rome. Alan, you've been to Rome, right? I've been to Italy, uh, northern, northwestern Italy, but I've not. Uh, I didn't make it to Rome. Uh, I think Genoa was the closest I came. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, speaking of Sparta, that's obviously the conversation that we're going to be having. Uh, Sparta, Athens. Uh, everything in between ancient Greece, and this has been uh, a Subject of conversation a number of times over the years on our podcast, and we're honored to have you. Um, my first question uh, regarding your book, uh, Sparta Sicilian Proxy War. So, you mentioned that the Athenians arrived at Sicily with too many ships for the Sicilians to welcome them. So, why is that? And Additionally, after the Athenians endured the plague and lost a large portion of their population, was conquering Sicily even Athens' actual initial plan? That's a very good question. Well, let me let me start with the first half of it. Um, there are Sicilians, uh, the enemies of Syracuse, who are more than willing to elicit and accept help from Athens. But when Athens sends in, say, the 420s, eventually, sends 60 ships, as opposed to the original 20, they begin to get nervous. Uh, In other words, whenever you have an alliance, the allies are wary of one another. They are joined together by a fear of a common enemy. But 
They fear each other. They fear that in the aftermath of the defeat of the common enemy, each fears that the other side will take advantage. So the cities that elicited Athenian support in the 420s get nervous when the Athenians send 60 as opposed to 20 ships. 20 ships is 4,000 men, 60 ships is, is uh, a, a great many more men, three times that many. Uh, and 60 ships would allow the Athenians to dominate the sea in the Western Mediterranean. 20 ships is a contribution. 60 ships is a threat. So that's the first element to it. Uh, as for the second question, um, initially, at the beginning of the Sicilian expedition, Alcibiades wants to take 60 ships. There is no mention of hoplites in addition to ships. Every ship will have uh, 10 Marines on it. So 60 ships would be 600 hoplites, which is a nominal force. He wants to send 60 ships to Sicily. He claims that his interest is conquering Sicily and maybe even Carthage. Uh, Alcibiades is very skilled at persuasion. What he's probably interested in is putting together a coalition in Sicily, which the Athenians will support with 60 ships. Now, at that stage, 60 ships might have been welcome because the threat to the Ionian-speaking cities, Syracuse, has been realized. So after the Athenians withdraw in the 420s and the Sicilian cities make peace with one another, the Syracusans take advantage of the peace to uh, eliminate a rival city, Leontini. That causes everybody to be nervous about the Syracusans. And it causes them to be more open to the Athenians sending a large force. But the force that the Athenians actually send is 134 triremes, each with a complement of 200 men, and a strong force of hoplites as well. That is obviously uh, an intervention aimed at conquest rather than an intervention aimed at supporting Athens allies in Sicily. And it has the effect of making everyone nervous. Look, it's a funny business in geopolitics, but by becoming stronger, you can become weaker. Interesting. The Kaiser Reich, prior to World War I, had begun building battleships and taking to the sea. It was supposed to strengthen Germany. It weakened it by driving the British into the hands of the French, their historic enemy, and the Russians, their enemy in the Far East. The Chinese today are building a great fleet. Never in their history, except for one short period in the 16th century, did they have a fleet of any significance. What's the effect of their building that fleet? It is to drive the Japanese, the Australians, the New Zealanders, the Vietnamese, the South Koreans, and the Filipinos into an alliance with the Americans. It's supposed to strengthen China. It, in fact, weakens it by taking neutral powers or quasi-neutral powers and making enemies of them, making them fearful. That's exactly what the Athenians do when they send uh, in, in 415, 134 triremes and a large hoplite force 
and light armed troops to Sicily. Obviously, you're you're what are you doing? You're displaying your strength. Mm -hmm. You can display your strength and weaken yourself. Well, I mean, that's what the that's what the uh, Germans did when they invaded uh, Belgium and Luxembourg to get to France. That's it. Well, they forced the British to actually make good on their arrangements with France and with Russia. Yeah, yes. was a, that scrap of paper, as they called it. <laughs> Look, the United States has had a great advantage um, in geopolitics because we have no territorial claims on anyone. We're outsiders. So we don't want to conquer anyone. We don't want to dominate anyone. We want to trade with them. The effect of it is we are a relatively safe country to ally with. Uh, the Chinese have a different tradition. Tradition of tribute in which trade is secondary. Domination. Yeah. That terrifies their neighbors. They prefer a weak China to a strong China. They prefer China the land power to China the sea power. Well, so, okay, so that you've pronounced the guy's name. I was going to call him Alka, Alkabiades. That's how I always knew him as, uh, but I guess the correct way is Al Alcibiades. Alcibiades in Alcibiades. English. Alcibiades. Alcibiades okay. Okay. in that's Greek. How I, well, that's how I pronounced him. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for right now before it confuses me. Um, okay, so now Alcibiades and uh, I'm a, I'll call him Nicias. Um, Nicias. Nicias. Okay. Yes. So, so we have Alcibiades and Nicias. <laughs> now they're they're going on the expedition. So if you could tell our listeners uh, who who they were, the, their relationship between the two. And um, I always considered uh, Alcibiades to be the Benedict Arnold of the Peloponnesian War. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that later on. But uh, on the re recalling him, did recalling Alcibiades doom the expedition? No, uh, but it weakened it. Look, he's the proponent of the expedition. He's the man with the plan. Now, the plan is undermined by the size of the force, which had not been the force that he had proposed. But he's a man of vigor. He's a man of audacity. Uh, he's Patton. Nicias is Eisenhower. So Nicias is a guy who will plan out a campaign right down to the fine details and then implement it. And he's very good at that. He's the most successful gen Athenian general in the Peloponnesian War. If something goes wrong, he doesn't know what to do. Alcibiades is the guy who grasps the situation, the moment, and knows how to act. Nicias is a moderate man never done much harm to anyone. He's a nice fellow. Alcibiades is, well, he's the sort of Bill Clinton of Athenian politics. When he's young, he's every man's woman. When he's older, he's every woman's man. Uh, he is the embodiment of Eros and on his shield, he has the emblem of Eros. So he's brilliant. He's ruthless. Uh, he's unprincipled. And he's likely to win. Nicias is not brilliant, but he's steady, methodical. Uh, he is not ruthless. We don't hear about him... Uh, uh, pers prosecuting uh, his rivals. Uh, and if audacity is required, he, he lacks it. So what happens is Alcibiades gets in trouble 
because of a religious offense, which he was probably guilty of some religious offense. He gets recalled. He knows that if he goes back to Athens, he will be tried. They will execute him in a rather ugly way. Uh, Nicias is, in effect, left in charge. And he approaches Syracuse, the main city on the island of Sicily. And in a systematic way, uh, the Athenians begin to uh, build walls around Syracuse so they can blockade it from the sea, which they control, as well as from the land. And he would have succeeded. He comes very close to succeeding. But Alcibiades, when he flees, goes to Sparta, and he persuades the Spartans to come to the defense of Syracuse. And he tells them all that they need to do is send one guy, one Spartan. And it will put steel into the backbones of the Syracusans, and it will decide the war. And that's exactly what happens. The Spartans send a man named Gallippus. Uh, uh, at the time that he arrives, the Syracusans are on the verge of trying to negotiate a surrender. Uh, he takes over their army. He drills it. He outwits the Athenians over and over and over again. And they find themselves in a situation in, in which... Instead of besieging Syracuse, they are besieged by the Syracusans. And the Athenians could, at that point, have taken to the sea and gone home. And their losses would have been minimal. But the political conflict at Athens is so bitter that Nicias fears that if he goes home, he will be charged with treason and executed which is the kind of thing the Athenians have done to other generals who failed. So there's a very bitter political conflict, and the courts are being used as part of that political conflict. If this sounds familiar, it is because that's exactly what's going on in the United States now. So I got a, I got a question. Um, you know, Alcibiades and Nicias are two, as you express, sort of two polar opposite individuals. Is it less their fault that they lost than the politics that was taking place in Athens? Like, should it have just been, you know what, we'll just send Nicias or we'll just send Alcibiades? Because I think in your book you express that, you know, from, from the get-go, before they even sent them off for this expedition they were already planning on recalling Alcibiades so was the loss more or less on on the politicians of Athens uh not just the politicians but the people of Athens since the people actually vote you know it's not a it's not a, a representative democracy it's a direct democracy so the people gather in the assembly and vote it is what I would call a self-inflicted wound. You know, they put themselves in this situation. They shouldn't have gone there at all. It's a stretch. It's 800 nautical miles from Attica through seas that are very rough and very dangerous. Uh, it requires an immense amount of money to support a force that size at that distance year round, on at on station year round. Um, there's not that much to gain. If they win, uh, it's not clear that they can hold what they've won. And the prospect of losing is very considerable. So they shouldn't have gone. If you're going to go, you should go for broke from the get-go. In other words, if you're going to be audacious, you should be audacious to the nth degree. Because surprise is your friend. If you go out there and dawdle, you lose the element of surprise and it weakens you. But they almost succeed anyway. 
And what Alcibiades does when he goes to Sparta is he persuades the Spartans to fight a proxy war against the Athenians. Without committing more than one man and later a handful of liberated helots, the Spartans can bleed the Athenians. Now, the Spartans and the Athenians have been at odds to one degree or another in a series of wars and then periods of exhaustion between the wars for 50 years at this stage. Uh, when you have these enduring political rivalries where neither side can deliver uh, a knockout blow to the other, you have a tendency for there to be proxy wars. Because of nuclear weapons, the United States and the Soviet Union were at odds, but couldn't deliver knockout blows. So what did the Soviets do? They fought a proxy war against us in Korea. It cost them no men. It cost them a certain amount of money and the excess uh, American armaments we had given them in World War II. They do the same thing to us in Vietnam. It bleeds us, it damages our morale, it messes up our army terrifically. We do the same thing to them in Afghanistan. And the effect of it is to bring down the Soviet regime. We go back into Afghanistan and the Pakistanis do that to us, supporting the Taliban. Uh, we go into Iraq and the Iranians and the Syrians do the same thing to us. The Russians have gone into Ukraine. We are bleeding them in the most extreme sort of way. It's an economic disaster for them. It's a geopolitical disaster for them. Yeah. Okay, Sparta does this to Athens at the risk of a single citizen, not one dime, no money, one citizen. That's crazy. What was about him that- uh... He, he, you know, it, it's, people often think the Athenians are intelligent, the Spartans are stupid. Well, if you read Thucydides' account, book six and seven of the Sicilian expedition, this Spartan, outwits the Athenians over and over and over again. These are people who understand war. They understand how to fight. They understand how to engage in a diversion with your left hand while you're doing something really important with your right hand. And Gallippus, the name of the Spartan who was sent out there, is a master at this. It's a very, very impressive performance on his part and a very poor performance on the part of Nicias. He isn't prepared for someone who's going to engage in a diversion while he hits him elsewhere. And he just, and he doesn't learn. And he does it over and over again. And by the way, Nicias is not the only one. Later in the Peloponnesian War, uh, another Spartan commander, Hagesandra does, does the same thing to the Athenians at Eretria. And later in the Battle of Aegispotomy, Lysander, this is the decisive battle of the Peloponnesian War, does exactly the same. He waits for the Athenians to make a mistake, and then he strikes like lightning. So uh, these Spartans are smart, and they know how to do great damage. And the big mistake the Athenians make is having been defeated initially, they don't withdraw and go back home. They stay. And then from Athens, a second expedition, a relief expedition is sent out. And the Syracusans, under the leadership of Gallippus, are victorious over 
the combined forces of the Athenians, and they annihilate them. There are very few Athenians who go out there who actually make it back to Athens. So the Athenians lose a tremendous amount of manpower, a couple hundred ships, uh, a lot of money, because supporting this over a long period of time, and we're talking two years, uh, is, is draining on their resources. And when it's over, they don't have a proper fleet. They have the capacity to build one, but they don't have the money to build it with because they've spent all their reserves. And this is not a world where you can borrow from the future by printing paper money or, or, or issuing bonds or anything like that. You have to have cash on the barrel head to do anything. So they waste their reserves on this um, risky operation. And then they find themselves at a tremendous disadvantage back home. And they never really are able to dig themselves out of this situation. Well, I was going to ask real quick, why did, uh, why did uh, Alci Alcibiades betray the Athenians rather than just go into exile? Because... I, I know he's, I, I understand the political situation, but why not just go into exile and say, you know what, screw you guys, I'm, I'm out of here. He wants to go back home. How can he get back home? If he puts the Athenians in a position where they're desperately in need of him, they will recall him. And that's exactly what happens. That's why, okay. He I begins by advising the Athenians. Then he advises the Spartans, and he can't control himself, so he sleeps with the wife of the Spartan king, which causes a certain um, um, rage, um, gets himself into trouble. Then he switched to the Persian side, because they intervene, and the Spartans are willing to do a deal with the Persians in order to defeat the Athenians at this stage. And he then uses all of this leverage to get the Athenians to recall him. And he becomes the principal leader at Athens again, briefly. The problem is, of course, they don't trust him. Well, I was gonna, okay, so I wanted to ask you now, would the Athenians have won had, had uh, Gallippus not uh, come into the picture? And, um, and, I, and, yes. I want to and I have a tactical question I want to ask you. Okay, let me answer the first one. They would have taken Syracuse. Could they have held it? That requires a garrison. Uh, did they have the manpower to supply an adequate garrison? In the long run, I think no. So it's a fool's errand, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Okay. But yes, they would have succeeded in uh, getting the Syracusans to surrender. It almost happened before Gallipus got there. And so, your tactical question now. My tactical question. So all the Athenian ships are trapped in the harbor. Why didn't they, instead of uh, abandoning camp and trying to escape, why didn't they just attack the southern end of where the blockade was and break the blockade and, and get the hell out? Okay, it, when you go there, I say when because you will go there. Uh, I did. Mm -hmm. uh, what you'll discover is that um, there's only one exit from the harbor. It's about a mile in length. And what the uh, Syracusans had done uh, under the direction of Gallippus and, and some people, the Corinthians had sent, and the Corinthians are a maritime power, so... They understand some of these things. They had taken a set of ships, mostly merchant ships, stretched them across the, har the mouth of the harbor and linked them together by a chain. So you've got to take that chain apart to get out. And the Athenians try. 
And there is a place left by the Syracusans, a narrow place, so a ship could come in and come out. And at that point, they can hook the chain up or they can loosen the chain. And the Athenians try to go for that spot, push the thing open and get through. And they fail. They fail because the Syracusans are very angry. And they are really going to fight over this. And the Athenians are rather desperate. And they're not now especially well fed because they have been without food shipments for some time. So they're, 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 they're on short rations. And that affects your strength. And this is all about physical strength. So, so they try to push their way out. And they come close to succeeding, but they fail. And it's at that point that they take to the land and try to march out. And the Syracusans pelt them with spears and arrows. Uh, and, you know, these people have very little water and very little food. And fresh water is always an issue, especially in a hot climate. So they're, they're weak when they're marching out. And the Syracusans have all the advantages. And it, it's a kind of uh, baton death march, something like that. Yeah. The real horror. I mean, what you read Thucydides is wonderful on this. He, he captures just how awful it was. But there were any number of occasions when the Athenians could have gotten away with fairly minimal losses maybe 10% of their force. Instead, they lose 95% of their force. It was like Stalingrad. Yes, it's immense. In the in the long run, like because you just mentioned like the, the losses of the Athenians and then the expense of the Spartans of one man and a few hoplites, how did this proxy war impact the overall war between the Athens between Athens and Sparta well it 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 has um three effects it persuades the Spartans that they can now defeat the Athenians in a thoroughgoing way um it puts the Athenians in a position where they don't have an adequate fl fleet of a fleet adequate for the defense of their empire in the Aegean Sea. And we're talking about about 150 cities that provide them with tribute. Uh, third, the Persians have been sitting off stage. They're immensely wealthy. This is the largest empire in human history. If you measure this empire, its resources uh, as a percentage of the resources of the world, no other empire in any other period has so large a proportion of the world's resources as the Persians do. And they have vast amounts of gold. So, they have been wanting to set the Athenians and the Spartans against one another for decades. But the Spartans have, haven't been willing to play ball. Now they are. And the defeat of the Athenians in Sicily impresses the great king of Sparta so much that he offers the Spartans the money they need to build a fleet to man the fleet, to pay the rowers. And you're talking about a lot of money when you've got two, 200, a crew of 200 for each ship to take on the Athenians at sea in the Aegean. So the Sicilian expedition is the turning point of the war. For the first time, the Spartans are in a position where they might well be able to defeat Athens on the element on which the Athenians have been dominant, which is to say 
the sea. Uh, now, it's hard for them to do that because they don't have the skills. But you get skills by trial and error, by practice, by being involved. And that's what happens between 413 and 404 BC. It takes the um, uh, the Spartans nine years to defeat the Athenians. And in the course of those years, the Athenians wipe out the Spartan fleet entirely on one occasion and do it great damage on another occasion. But the Persian money's there. They can rebuild the fleet. And the Athenians are short of cash at all times. So the Athenians have their backs against the wall. They fight gallantly. They fight bravely. It's really very, very impressive what they do, but it is not enough. And one of the reasons it's not enough is they turn on one another again as they had turned on Alcibiades at the time of the Sicilian expedition. So, for example, they recall him because he's been very successful against the Persians. And one of his lieutenants makes a mistake and they cashier Alcibiades. And he flees because he knows what will come for him. Then uh, they, uh, in desperation, find themselves having to put together a ragtag fleet uh, to battle the Persians. That fleet is victorious, but its commanders fail to pick up uh, the, uh, the bodies of those who died in the battle and to rescue those who had whose ships had been sunk but who were still afloat themselves. They fail to do that because a storm comes up and it becomes impossible. The Athenians execute the generals that come home. Beautiful. You know, it, it, executing victorious generals, mm -hmm. they start out executing generals who fail. So there's no honest failure. You must be guilty of treason. On this occasion, after the Battle of Arganusai, they execute the successful generals. Then they send out more people as generals, most of whom haven't had a lot of experience. And they make a hash of it, which isn't very surprising. So the the... The politics of Athens is mad, yeah. and they they engage in ventures they shouldn't engage in. They uh, get rid of people who have talent. They get rid of successful generals, and they put people in charge who don't know what they're doing. I got a question with uh, with the with the successful generals being executed. Is that solely because of the supposed Athenian fear of tyranny? Or is is that just an excuse that they used? Or like why would you do that? Because I my, religious I, mania. Okay, when 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 they go after Alcibiades, fear of tyranny, because he's he's a man of moment, uh is no doubt a part of it. There are people who cannot stand the possibility that he will be absolutely dominant and he's likely to be on the later occasion. Uh, it has to do with grief at the loss of citizens who weren't, who, who weren't recovered. Uh, and you've got to understand the Greeks think the ancient Greeks think that if you do not bury a man, uh, his spirit will wander throughout the world in misery, uh, and he will plague his relatives. Okay. 
So uh, it's a it's a kind of religious hysteria um, that grips the Athenians, and of course there are rival politicians who will take advantage of this to try to eliminate rivals. Look, when when politics descends into using the courts to destroy your rivals, you're on the verge of civil war. Yeah, I mean... You know, in other words, it's one thing seeing that right to now. humiliate your rival. He loses the election. He's got to go back home with his tail between his legs. Um, that's hard. But if your life, your property your children's property, their citizenship is all at stake, then politics becomes a deadly game which will be fought in a bloody way. Well, I know that um, during this time, democracy was overthrown in Athens and they, uh, they had an oligarchy for a while. I think it was an oligarchy. Um, and then I think they had democracy again at the end, and then they were defeated. And I know Alcibiades was murdered, but I don't know by who. I mean, what? Help me out here on this one. After the disaster in Sicily, the Athenians lose faith in the democracy with some reason. And in his attempts to manipulate his way back from the court of the Persian satrap in Asia Minor, Socrates tells the Athenians he can deliver Persian support to them, which means money, which they desperately lack, but not if they re retain the democracy. They have to have an oligarchy. They'd already been moving in that direction because they'd lost heart. And so a group of people set up an oligarchy at Athens, initially in the hopes of getting Persian money, later uh, on the conviction that, well, they're stuck. They've gone down that road and there's sort of no way back but to try to sustain the thing. That's part of the story. Another part of the story is Spartan strategy in this war was aimed at dividing Athens um, in two. Uh, many Athenians depend on farming for their livelihood. As a consequence of the league established after the Persian Wars to fend off the Persians, uh, a league that turns into an empire dominated by Athens, another population grows up that is dependent upon the income from that empire. All right, the one population, what they most fear is the Spartans will send a military force into Attica and prevent them from sowing their land, deprive them of their livelihood. The other one doesn't care one whit about the welfare of the farmers. They want the empire to expand so there is more tribute money coming in. And the Spartans deliberately set these two populations against one another by establishing in 413 a fort in Attica from which they prevent the Athenians from even sowing their crops. And that was Aquabiati's idea, wasn't it? It, it was his suggestion, yes. Okay. Um, and it works because, uh, look, the, the Athenians have no money, so they have to confiscate the money of people who have money. A lot of those people own sizable farms, but they have no income. So it's being confiscated are their reserves. And so they're being impoverished by this. You know, by the extra cost mm -hmm. of supporting the, the, the ships and the denial to them of income. And those are the people who are interested in setting up an oligarchy and bringing the war to an end. I wanted to ask you this question. 
Um, and it's because you know the situation real well. Had the Spartans and the Athenians not fought, had they remained united, there were two other powers in the region other than Persia. There was the uh, Carthaginians and the Romans were in the, they had just become a republic about about a hundred years, not, not even a hundred years, maybe 80 years prior. I'm not exactly right. sure the date. So had they not fought each other and had they taken Sicily for any number of reasons, I mean, they already had a, a they already had people in Southern Italy, if I remember correctly, could that have changed history by either, I don't know, I mean, allying with the Carthaginians or allying with the Romans and then they became the dominant power? I, I was wondered about that. Never had the chance to the ask Roman, anyone. The Romans are not a force. Okay. They're not a force at this stage. The Carthaginians dominate the Western Mediterranean. And they're a commercial power. So they don't dominate by exacting tribute they dominate by mo monopolizing trade i was going to say there were pro-carthaginian towns in sicily there were um carthaginian colonies in sicily okay and the carthaginians were interested in conquering sicily so they 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 they're thinking militarily there they hold sardinia but mostly they simply dominate the trade and the trade out into the Atlantic as well. Tin from the Scilly Isles off of Great Britain, um, gold from down the African coast. Uh, I mean, they don't go too far, although there, there is a case to be made that, that there was a Carthaginian ship that circumnavigated Africa. That was mentioned in Herodotus. Yes, and That's he cool. says... This is impossible because part of the trip, the sun rose on their right. Uh -huh. And the other part of the trip, the sun rose on their left. That can't be. Yeah. And what he's describing is exactly what would happen if you circumnavigated Africa. Yeah, I think I mentioned this to uh, Dustin one time that the uh, that the Phoenicians, I don't know if they, I mean, was that a Phoenician or a, because the, yeah. the Carthaginians were Phoenician. Yes, they were. And um, I know that I know that there was a discussion about circumnavigating Southern Africa. Um, but I mentioned that that because we were talking about Col Christopher Columbus and the flat Earth. And I said by then they knew that the Earth wasn't flat. So, right. uh, you know, um, but I mentioned the fact that Her in Herodotus, in his histories book, that he mentions that very right. expedition. Uh, look, uh, there were ancient Greeks who thought the Earth was round. The flat earth was not a universal opinion, yeah. really, at any time. Um, uh, the the uh, Alcibiades, one of his ambitions was to conquer Sicily and then Carthage. But here, here's your problem. Athens and Sparta are different. Sparta doesn't want anything that it doesn't have. It is a city of gentlemen who live on the labor of a servile class called helots. These helots outnumber them perhaps seven to one. Uh, if the Spartans try to get more, the likelihood that they will end up losing everything is high uh, because their task is to keep the helots down. Keep the helots down, the Arcadians who are their nearest neighbors in in an alliance with them and to keep the Argives, their traditional enemies out. They don't want anything more. So they will ally with Athens to prevent Persia from returning. Yeah. Well, but, but they don't have any uh, expeditionary impulses. So if that peace had gone on, perhaps the Athenians would have tried to conquer Sicily the way they tried uh, and moved on to Carthage. But here's the problem. There's a big difference between Greek cities and Rome. The Greek cities do not naturalize citizens. You can't migrate 
to Athens and become an Athenian citizen. That would take a vote in the assembly about you personally. It happens, but very rarely. Um, if the Athenians have slaves and free them, the slaves do not become citizens. They become resident aliens, and after a certain number of years, they have to leave. The Romans assimilate people. If you free your slaves at Rome, they become half citizens. Their children become citizens. When the Romans conquer a people, by various gradual steps, they absorb them into the Roman Kiwitas. So Roman manpower grows and grows and grows. So the Romans can conquer places and garrison them. The Greeks can't do that. So Ath there's a natural limit to Athens' empire, and it's the Aegean. And Sicily is, it's a bridge too far. Had, had um, Athens and Sparta, had Greece in general um, conducted themselves like the Romans, do you think that there would have ever been the rise of Philip and Alexander from no, Macedon? No, no, because had the Greeks been organized as a single polity, they would have had the manpower to stop Philip. As it is, he could divide and conquer. So it would have been like the American Civil War to an extent. Yeah. Yeah. Although keep in mind, the Macedonians weren't really Greeks. So it isn't exactly a civil war. Okay. It would be as if Mexico conquered the United States. Uh and what would enable Mexico to conquer the United States? That the individual states weren't united. Mm -hmm. There was no United States. They were at odds with one another, squabbling, fighting, and so forth. And you could play them against one another. Yeah. Look, in the early American Republic, people like George Washington and Alexander Hamilton want peace because they're afraid that the colonies that united in the United States won't stay together in a union if the union comes under pressure. They think that in time, there will be a sense of loyalty to America as a whole, as opposed to loyalty to South Carolina or to Virginia or to Maine or to Massachusetts. So they want a period of peace in which there can be a kind of consolidation and the emergence of a sense of nationhood. Um, think of what it would have been like if each of the American colonies had been independent. Then Mexico could have played the colonies off against one another and conquered. That's the Greek situation. Well, Alan, I, I don't have any more questions. Do you have anything else, man? Now is your great chance. Well, mm. how trustworthy? You want to talk about the uh, historians, ancient historians, Herodotus, Thucydides, Xenophon, Plutarch? Their reliability? Like, you, you, you stay, and actually, you're, you're not obviously the only one, Paul, uh, who makes this notion about ancient historians but it's sort of one of those uh inserts into the the text of of modern uh history books is if this person is to be believed and it's reflecting on an ancient historian like plutarch or thucydides how reliable are these ancient historians and does it really even matter if they're reliable since Apparently, this is all we have. Um, with Herodotus, you've got hearsay. That is to say, he's very blunt about this. He says, I will tell you what I was told. Uh, most of it's pretty good. And I'll give you an example. Every once in a while, you, you can check things. He tells the story of Darius's rise to power in Persia. He says there were seven conspirators. 
He names them. There is an inscription about halfway between Babylon and Ekbatana, up on a mountainside, showing Darius and the various peoples that he conquered in coming to power. It mentions his co-conspirators. The names are the same except for one. And that one is a very important person at the court because we, we learn about him elsewhere. So is Herodotus' account perfect? No. But it's astonishingly good. And his account is released, published is a little bit too strong a word, about 100 years after the events. And he's got six of the seven names of the conspirators right. And the story he tells is pretty much the same story. Now, is the story true? Well, it is the story that Darius wanted people to hear. Uh, so it's the, the official story. Uh, and uh, there may be some reason to think that... Um, as told, it reflects all too favorably on Darius. But still, what you've got is a guy who has searched out as best he can what happened. And he tells you what he was told. And he compares the stories he's told by different people. So it's pretty good. Thucydides is writing about history that took place in his lifetime. He knew most of the people in the story. He sought out eyewitnesses. And he tells us he went to infinite trouble. Can we test him? Yes. Early, for example, in um, uh, book one, we hear about an expedition of ships being sent by the Athenians to Corsaira. Thucydides mentions two generals. We have an inscription. Turns out there were three generals, but the two that Thucydides mentioned are accurate. So is he perfect? No. Is he awfully good? Yes. I'll give you another example. He quotes verbatim uh, a treaty, more or less a truce, that was ratified by both sides, Sparta and Athens, in 421. We have an inscription with that treaty on it from Olympia. There were three or four of these inscriptions put up. It is word for word the same, except for two words, both of them inconsequential. It's perfectly possible that one of the other inscribed versions had those two words different. But otherwise, other than those two words, Thucydides' account is accurate down to every last little detail. So he worked very hard to be accurate. And we can trust him to a very considerable degree. Xenophon, uh, it's a, it, his narrative is sort of once over lightly. He covers uh, a, 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 a period, a considerable period uh, in fewer pages than Thucydides. Uh, do we know of any case where he got the facts wrong? No. Do we know of things that are pertinent, that we think pertinent, that he doesn't tell us about? Yes. He doesn't take the task of the historian as seriously as Thucydides does. It's still pretty good, though. So on the whole, I think you can trust the ancient sources. 
which doesn't mean that there's not more to be learned. Things they didn't tell you or didn't know about that we would think pertinent and they didn't. Interesting. All right. Well, Paul, uh, it was enlightening and a lot of fun to have you on the, on the podcast. Um, great, great answers, great information, great depth. Uh, thanks for all you, uh, your work, your, your lifetime of, of work, uh, on ancient Greece and just, just the ancient world. Um, it's just the, the things that you've accomplished in your lifetime is just phenomenal. Can you tell you, your listeners, my name is spelled R A H E mm -hmm. and there are five books on the grand strategy of Sparta, all of them in print and available from Amazon. You, well, yes, that's, uh, we and will, next year we will there will be know. a sixth. So this, and this is number five, correct? The, That's the right. One? And number yeah. six will be Sparta's third Attic War. And that will bring the Peloponnesian War to a conclusion. And it's in press. Awesome. It's all over after that. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Paul. Take care. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. All right, Dustin, that was a fantastic interview. Good job on picking this gentleman. I, uh, you know, the, the ancient Greek, ancient Greece, the Greek world, the Persian world, all that, you know, that that's one of my favorite subjects. And, uh, well, you know, uh, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, all those guys felt the same way. So we are now at the same level as uh, Jefferson and Adams and Franklin, if you think about it, you know, at least. You know. Who? You and I? No. You, I, and our listeners. See, we're oh. elevating not only us, but our listeners. We, Absolutely. We, we want are. them to be. That's the only you know, reason we do the show. We want we want our listeners to be classically educated. Yes. We want you to be classically educated and morally elevated. Something like that. And something like that. Oh, yeah. by, by the no, by, I've been biting my tongue throughout the whole the whole interview. Yeah, I know. You want to say I, something to me? Go I ahead. I told the, the, the radio person that I was with the Sons of History. I said, I'm a co-host of the Sons of History. And I mentioned your name specifically. It's not my fault that in the promo, she only put the Epoch Times and didn't mention the... I, I didn't create that promo. So just... You know what I think it is? I think it's that your friend doesn't like me, much like all of your friends don't like me. And for good reason. Well, that's true, but that's... We're, we're addressing the promo here, so... Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, let's go back and let's talk about Paul again, because I think that's what everyone wants to hear about. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a really... Just, like, a ton of just great answers and information, and, you and, know... And he knew the answers, too. I mean, that he was like... He didn't sit there and... Yeah, he didn't sit there like one of your buddies. Uh, well, you got me there. <laughs> Speaking of that guy, you're still a big fan. I I can't wrap my head around it. Anyways, I'm not. Yeah, I'm well, not gonna, least, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I'm not going she there. got somebody to look up to, right? Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this show, this episode. Um, we will be with you next week. It's going to be a fun conversation. Who's going to be with us? I don't know, but whoever it is, it's going to be a lot of fun. And you'll enjoy it. You'll learn a lot. You'll be educated, elevated, motivated, and... Entertained. Entertained. <laughs>